The year is 1943. A man takes a picture of his three-year-old daughter with his Rolleiflex twin lens reflex camera, and she says, Dad, why can't I see the picture now? And then, like no dad ever in history, he says, you're right, honey. I'm going to invent that for you. <laughs> this is the history of Polaroid, and it's crazy. It goes from then up until the Polaroid one-step cameras that are once again alive. In that process, they build U-2 reconnaissance spy planes. They're and part of one of the biggest lawsuits in the history ever. They There is a multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme that still has a previous owner of Polaroid in Leavenworth. We're covering all this for you, but first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need your own website, portfolio, or store, you can make it happen with Squarespace. It's so easy to do. Tony and I have about a dozen of them now. We just can't stop. If you want your very own Squarespace website, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea, and you can get 10% off with the coupon code Chelsea. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. You have to spell it properly. Thank you, Squarespace. <laughs> Edwin Land definitely would have liked Squarespace because... He was a brilliant businessman, and he understood the importance of presentation. And the user experience. Okay, so we've been reading the first comments of our podcast and sharing them. And this first comment is from our previous podcast, Dear Clients, Photographers Deserve Fair Pay. Ronald Sand says, The problem is that phones and cameras are so good. Anyone can create a sharp, vivid image. Attributes like composition and lighting, etc., are often not appreciated by the customers without a direct comparison shown. Years ago, getting reliable, great pictures on film was only in the realm of professionals and capable enthusiasts. So he thinks that because photography is easier and more accessible, photographers are getting paid less. I think that's actually a really relevant comment to this podcast because I think that the essence of Polaroid was making photography accessible, easy, fast, instant for everyone. And so this might actually be the very beginnings of the phenomenon that our first commenter is talking about. So that one was really kismet. All right, I wanted to talk about how you know Polaroid. You've probably seen it everywhere. I don't think there's a person who hasn't had a Polaroid photo taken of them. You've seen celebrities using it. Andy Warhol had a Polaroid camera and he took pictures of Marilyn Monroe and Dolly Parton, a bunch of other celebrities. And now you even see celebrities using their Polaroid cameras. You see Taylor Swift, one of her album covers was a Polaroid style photo. And so it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. Everyone has had an experience with this instant film and it's fun. Yes, we do not have to explain what instant photography is because everybody understands it, even in the digital era. I've introduced a couple of smaller children to instant photography, yeah. and they grew up on smartphones, but they still love the feel of an analog, real-world picture. Yeah, it's funny. I've seen you take pictures of kids, and you just run out a whole thing of film because they all want one. <laughs> Let's introduce Edwin Land, a scientist and businessman. He was born in 1909 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's not too far from us, Tony. And he went to high school at Norwich Free Academy, which is only like 10 minutes for us. Maybe not exciting for you, but relevant to us. Uh, he graduated with honors, went on to Harvard College, where he wanted to study optics and physics. He dropped out after the fall semester, moved to New York City, studied at the New York Public Library on his own, reading books about physics, and got into polarization. And that's also where he met his future wife, Helen Land, uh, Helen Maisley, her maiden name. And she majored in physics at Smith College. So now we have this power couple. They're both into physics. They're both in New York City. And it's actually Helen's professor who coined the word Polaroid. And so they were working together as lab partners. They were breaking into the lab at Columbia University through a window so that they could do research together. They were partners in crime. Now, I, you can imagine why I like this story. <laughs> By 1929, he patented the polarized lens. Can we get nerdy for a little bit? I know our audience is photographers here, and I think most of us know the effect of polarized lenses, which are, they sort of block reflected light. They'll make skies go from white to kind of blue. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how they actually work? Yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. It's basically a chemical blinds like you have on your windows. So um, the molecules align parallel to one another to form these kinds of slots and crystals. Light waves would only pass through the blinds one way. So even though that patent happened in the 30s, we did not get a Polaroid camera until the 40s. 
Yeah, right now Edwin, he's figured this out and he patents stuff, but then he also buys up all the competing patents that infringe upon it. So he basically has just 100% of the polarizing related patents. And he begins to think, how can I make some money with this? Yeah, so he goes back to school. He goes back to Harvard University. He's studying, he's doing his own research on polarization still. And one of his professors, George Wheelwright, says, like, you don't really need college. Why don't we just run with this idea and I'll start a company with you? So in 1932, uh, they formed Land Wheelwright Laboratories. They hired a bunch of scientists to work on this polarization idea, a marketing team, a PR team. And then they got a lot of investments from, like, J.P. Morgan, another big financial institution, to make this idea go. So they were building these polarizing filters and they were also building educational kits for schools where they would teach children about polarization. And by the time 1934 rolls around, the business is actually struggling. In comes Eastman Kodak. Yeah, so they don't have their own camera at this point, but Eastman Kodak comes in and says, we have a, bra a problem with glare happening on our black and white film when they're taken in, when the pictures are taken in like bright light we can use your polarizing filter, and he orders $10,000 worth, which is $200,000 uh, worth of products, and that's a big contract for a company that's really struggling. Um, so at this point, Edwin Land, he gets together with his little crew of scientists, they build a machine that can help uh, put out all the product for Eastman Kodak, and they start working on that contract. Seems like Polaroid and Kodak are getting along just great. I hope they maintain this friendly relationship <laughs> indefinitely. If you aren't familiar with the company Kodak, we have a separate podcast covering their history. And it is far crazier than this history. It's scary, yeah. upsetting. I love these camera histories because I just never think of who founded them and their journey to get to where they were. But, whoa, mm -hmm. it's always interesting. Um, by 1937, Land and Wheelwright finally turned the company into Polaroid, the company that we know today. And their first widely applicable use for this Polaroid film, this lens that they invented, is polarized glasses, which I don't know if you knew that. I have polarized glasses. I, never, I had no idea it had anything to do with Polaroid. No, I never equated the two. So they had this idea for these cool glasses. It was kind of a novelty. They were a bit expensive, but they were in ads in like this cool, practical way to cut the light. And 1939, the World's Fair, which was this showcase for high-tech stuff, there was a big Chrysler ad. It was a 3D video, something people had really never seen before. It was made using little polarized lenses, and it's still the way 3D glasses work today. On your left eye, you'll have a lens with the polarizers aligned horizontally, let's say. And then on the right eye, they'll be at a 90 degree angle vertically. And then they basically project two separate images, one for your left eye, one for your right eye. And the different polarizations block out the other light, so each eye gets a separate view. That hasn't changed since 1939. Know, <laughs> that was cool. a Polaroid thing. Yeah, so at this point, he's just really working on this polarized glass. By 1940, all of their sales at that point had been from that Eastman Kodak contract, which was a huge boost for the company. And then after that, it was all glasses sales. They were just selling mostly sunglasses, and then those sales were dropping off to the point where sales had dropped 100 k um, and that was in 1940s money, not in current day money, uh, and they were really struggling. The company was in danger of going under, but a terrible event happened to be a good event for Polaroid because, <laughs> I know, it's dark. It's not my fault, Tony. It's the 1940s. World War II is happening, and the U.S. economy is actually kind of booming during wartime, uh, and Land says, let's just scrap all this glasses stuff for now and let's focus on the U.S. military and start making high-tech optics for the armed forces. And they end up getting like a million, dollar in a million dollars in contracts from the U.S. government in 1942. So again, they're in danger of going out of business and then they're getting military contracts. By 1945, Polaroid had 1,250 people on the payroll. So almost going out of business ton of employees. Things have turned around. And in the middle of World War II, we have the story that I opened with, where Jennifer Land, Edwin's daughter, asks him why we can't see the picture immediately. He told the story 30 years later. She asked him that question, and he immediately said, Jennifer, go to your mom. 
<laughs> and then he proceeded to walk alone for hours because it was the 40s and that's just what dads did. He said, by the end of the walk, the solution to the problem had been pretty well formulated, except for those few details that took from 1943 to 1973. <laughs> and that is kind of true. He really did, just a few years later in 1948, put the first Polaroid camera on market with instant film. It was the Model 95. It was Sapia film, but it wasn't great. <laughs> it was a real problem. The, the, it was technically instant film, but the color was brown and white. It was smudgy and, uh, you know, it faded quickly. Like it wasn't going to, there's none around really today because they didn't hold up to just the environment. It was also difficult to use. You had to really know how to use the camera. Uh, the film didn't pop out automatically. You had to pull it out and you often got chemicals on your hands. So it was a difficult process. It was also $89 in 1948 and that's like $1,000 in today dollars. So that's a lot of money. That's a rich early adapter is going to invest in that, but there's not going to be one in every home. It's a thousand bucks, but also it's not like digital cameras where every picture you take is free. Like every picture you took was actually really expensive. Yeah. Can so you imagine poor Jennifer Land if I can back up? Like you ask your dad a simple question when you're three and he just disappears forever to make a camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's really almost no information about his family because he kept them out of the public eye. Uh, and but also his biographers say that he didn't spend a lot of time with his family. He was very work centric. And when you we we. When we research these sort of incredible people who've accomplished a lot, they often make that choice. They set their family aside in order to do bigger things, I guess. Yeah, I tried to research the family, and they're actually very private. When he died, they went through all of his lab notes with any personal information and got rid of it so that it could never be recorded. So this is a story of Polaroid, not Edwin Land, but he was a really interesting guy. And so through the 1950s and 60s, he's doing stuff pretty unrelated to Polaroid. For example, he works with the US military to design um, the camera and some of the mechanics for the U-2 reconnaissance plans. You know the name of the band, U-2. This is what we had before we had spy satellites. We just put this big old plane with huge wings up in the air and just floated it way high in the atmosphere where surface to air missiles couldn't get it and they would just take pictures of the enemy. Edwin Land had a real part in that. In the 50s, he also started a study of human color vision, which is still a huge part of the foundation of modern understanding for color vision, just how we see stuff. And what I think ended up being a huge moment in US history, he urged Eisenhower to form a spirit of scientific adventure. And when you think about that statement and the, the future of America through the 50s, 60s, 70s, where we put men on the moon and did so much else, like I think he had a really formative part in what America came to be. Yeah, he influenced that scientific spirit. In the 1960s, they gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. He is like a rock star nerd. So we're not going to cover every camera. We wanted to cover some of the more influential cameras. And another one is the Swinger. So you had that first camera that was like $1,000. It was very messy. It wasn't for every person. When the Swinger came out, they wanted to make it more affordable and easier to use. So in 1965, they made it $20. That's like $165 in today money. And they marketed it towards teenagers, saying that it was fun, it was easy. You could carry it with you everywhere and record what you're doing. Can we um, watch an ad for the Swinger? Yeah, let's watch the commercial. And when you look at the reviews, um, they weren't great. <laughs> no, because uh, the film still was kind of messy. The camera was still difficult to use. The instructions were basically make sure you read the instructions or else none of your pictures will come out. So it wasn't as intuitive or easy as future models. And as far as the chemistry of the film goes, they've been making progress. Like it's no longer sepia, it's black and white. They've got it coated so the pictures last longer. They're working to increase the contrast of the black and white. And they also start working on the problem of color. Right. Which is actually a really complex thing. So let's review. The first camera they put out, inaccessible, 
expensive and difficult to use. The second camera, accessible but difficult to use. And now in 1972, they've got the Model SX-70, which is easy to use and works well. And they made a lot of developments with the film, but it was still $180, which is over $1,000 in today's money. So it was for early adapters, but they would be pleased with the results. People still love this camera. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it's like a transformer of cameras. It's So you can see a picture there where it's expanded, but it actually collapses down into, it looks like a flask, kind of, and they say that it's pocketable. It You could pocket it if you had very large pockets, but it's still, the idea of being pocketable, I think, was important because that led to this idea that uh, photography should be something you always have with you. You should always have a camera, and we very much live that today. Speaking of easy and accessible and affordable, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, Squarespace, because if you can drag and drop your photos, you can make a Squarespace within 10 minutes. I do not have the attention span to figure out coding. I just want to see my beautiful pictures looking professional, and I was able to set up multiple websites, a gallery, a store. It's so easy to do. You can definitely make your own Squarespace today and start selling your prints and start looking professional. So you can get your free trial today for 14 days, no credit card needed. And when you decide to buy it, which I know you will, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. And that's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. We have to spell that properly. We're gonna take Polaroid through multiple bankruptcies and then the reemergence Let's go through the rest of the history. I want to talk about the business model of Polaroid. We've talked about how much the film has cost and how consumers kind of hated that, but that was also what made them successful. Same with Kodak. Sell the camera pretty much at a cost and then sell the film with a profit. A huge profit, yeah. And when people love it, they're going to keep buying the film. So you can sell one device cheap, but you keep making money. Speaking of Kodak, they saw Polaroid starting to cut into the profits that they had on their 35 millimeter cameras, film, and processing systems. And so Kodak made the Kodomatic. It's a very similar name to the Instamatic. And in 1977, just one year later, Polaroid says, hey, this is way too similar to what we do, and we own all, yeah. well, all the patents for it, so we're going to sue you. They sued them for billions. They didn't get billions, but it was really close. In 1986, Kodak has to remove the Kodomatic from shelves. And they actually end up paying money to everybody who bought a Kodomatic because they're no longer allowed to make the film and thus people don't get the use out of it that they plan to. In 1991, there's finally a settlement because Kodak, also really good at lawsuits, uh, had been fighting it this whole time. But it finally comes to an end. Kodak settles for $909 million, or in today's money, about $1.75 billion, which would make it the biggest settlement in history in the world. Let's talk about Fujifilm. Yeah, Kodak definitely made a dent by creating instant film competition. Yeah. There was another company out of Japan called Fujifilm, which we all know today, and they started making the Photorama in 1981, and you can guess what happens next. Lawsuits. Polaroid sues them. <laughs> but Fujifilm handles it better. They say, we Fujifilm have a bunch of intellectual property that you would like. We would mm -hmm. like to use your patents. Let's trade. And they do trade. And as a result, you can still buy Fujifilm Instax cameras. And they're still really popular. And our daughter even has one and loves it for the same reasons that Polaroid is popular. Do you think that the trade made the difference? Or do you think it was more difficult to sue a foreign company? Well, that was definitely part of it, too. Yeah, in fact, maybe the trade wouldn't have been as appealing if suing companies in Japan wasn't so difficult at the time. I mean, Americans, the lawsuits are everywhere, but the Japanese are probably like, what are you talking about? You bring up a good point, because especially we've studied other Japanese camera companies, and they did have a history of just blatantly copying <laughs> other cameras. Uh, they had a history of blatantly copying other cameras, and uh, part of it was how they treated intellectual property in their law systems. Um, but the single biggest competition was really cheap, 35 millimeter film and cameras. Yeah, the same concept, a pocketable camera that's easy to use and inexpensive, but it was far less expensive. So Polaroid profits keep dropping. In 1981, Edwin Land retires from Polaroid. So by the mid to late 80s, we start to see 
35 millimeter disposable cameras take over and I know that's what my family used. We always had disposable cameras around and they're so inexpensive and they produce pretty good quality images, especially compared to the fairly small images you got out of Polaroids, that they skyrocket and really cut into Polaroid profits. In 1991, we see Edwin Land die just a decade after leaving Polaroid. And then a decade later, in 2001, Polaroid files for bankruptcy. We skate over things like a company going bankrupt, but I want to take a second and talk about a friend of mine because I lived just outside of Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2001. And uh, I had a friend who was a vice president at Polaroid, and he had worked there basically his whole life. And Polaroid gave him a pension. Pension is retirement savings. But unlike a 401k or an IRA, which are sort of managed by a financial institution, the, in a pension, the private company manages the money. And when you go bankrupt, that money can be used to pay off debtors yeah. that the company owes money to. And so he pretty much lost his pension. He was just a couple of years from retirement, but he and his wife had to continue working longer than they planned. So we can talk about a company going under quickly, but every person who works at that company can be pretty profoundly impacted. Yeah, it's not just was. a company going under, it's every single person that works for them. And we saw that with our Kodak history as well. We also knew people that worked for Kodak where their whole career just disappeared. So. It's, it's a traumatic event. Now things get weird. <laughs> Let's introduce Tom Petters. In 2005, his worldwide organization buys Polaroid for $426 million. 2008, the FBI begins investigating him for a $3.6 billion Ponzi scheme. Tell us about a Ponzi scheme, Chelsea. What is that? A Ponzi scheme is, let's put it really simply, you get investors to invest in your company, which is not real, and then when they go to sell off, there's no real profits to give them, so you give them the money of all of the new people buying in. It's essentially a pyramid scheme. Everyone at the bottom is getting crushed. The Tom Petters of the world usually win, but not Tom Petters. No, in 2010, he was sentenced to 50 years for fraud. And today, he is still in Leavenworth, as far as I can tell. Where's Leavenworth? I don't, I don't know. Why do you it's say like it like it's like weighty? Like, what do I, what don't I know about Leavenworth? Oh, I don't know. If I think of like hardcore prisons, like that's what I think of. It's oh, like it's like Alcatraz, except still around. Okay, um, I didn't know. I don't know about prison. Look, I'm wearing a cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to explain. While Petters is in Leavenworth, his company goes bankrupt and they auction off what's left of Polaroid for a measly $59 million to a company called Patriot Partners. And at, at this point, you really can't buy Polaroid stuff. Like, they're just sort of gone, forgotten about. But they come back thanks to the impossible project. For $3.1 million, they bought a Polaroid factory and all the equipment in it, and then they hired a bunch of Polaroid employees. But they didn't get the patents to the film formulations. Yeah. So what was impossible about this was they decided they were going to try to make some instant film without relying on the old technology. This is actually impossible film right here. We bought some of it. Well, they reached out to us and sent it to us. When, we, when our YouTube channel was pretty new, and I remember we took pictures with it uh, on a live show, and it didn't work well. It did, was not the Polaroid that we remembered. Well, it's because they couldn't use the same technology that was in the patents, obviously, so they had to kind of try to reinvent the wheel, and uh, it didn't work that well. It takes a very long time to develop, and the results weren't great. But luckily, by 2017, they were able to get the patents, get the rights to the patents, and get the exact formulas that Pol Polaroid used and um, buy the Polaroid brand. And so everything that they have now is actually Polaroid. They rebranded the Impossible Project to Polaroid Originals. And they've launched, relaunched some of the original Polaroid cameras, like the Polaroid One Step that you're holding here. You can essentially mm -hmm. buy new. And they've also integrated some new technology like Bluetooth and stuff. And it's real and it works and you can go on Amazon and it has four and a half stars and people love them. Yeah, you can do a double exposure too. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, and you can pull up your phone and like adjust the settings and do manual long exposures with light painting and 
all sorts of cool stuff that you could never do. And it's this amazing resurrection of something that everybody thought was dead and gone. But while cheap film seemed to have killed it off, digital cameras actually made this seem so valuable. To hold something physically in your hands to the younger generation who's just used to digital selfies, it's so amazing. So we went to pick up our friend's dog because we were pet sitting and he pulled up his Polaroid camera and took a picture of us and our teenage daughter thought it was so cool. Everybody wanted a copy. So, uh, I mean, it's old technology, but it's still so much fun. I think it's cool. I'm really glad that they saved the brand. Me too. I would love to hear your stories about Polaroid. How did Polaroid cameras impact you? And if you're somebody who worked at Polaroid, I would love to hear some inside stories about stuff that went on because there really isn't too much salacious written about Polaroid itself. But I know the yeah. people that work there must have some cool stories. Definitely. Thanks for watching the Picture This Photography Podcast. We've been doing this for years, so there's a bunch more episodes. If you go to your favorite podcasting app, you can find our backlog and listen to them all or watch them all. Thank you, Squarespace, for supporting this podcast. If you'd like your very own Squarespace website, you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.